welcome to North Rowett. Um, everybody all came this morning, and I think it's going to be really fun and beautiful. Uh, I have a, an announcement to make before this. I know you saw these little uh, papers there on the table, and there's some more uh, regarding the weekend book fair here. And it's amazing. If you didn't get a paper, the speakers are quite wonderful. And plus, you get to see the garden, the new garden area, the new neighborhood thing. And that is so much bigger than you realize when you're just driving by. So anyway, I want to be sure you all remember and come. Um, and then before we start, Dana asked me to do our drawing first so that she doesn't because she said she, I told her she could talk as long as she wants. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, if y'all get your, uh, you, you, you got it. Okay. Um, get your ticket out and we'll draw. Let someone draw. Plus, what? All right. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is a we have two $25 gift certificates uh, from the compliments of the library and. Uh, data. And the first number is 366689. Last three numbers, 89. Oh, six, that's me. 689. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. Got one. Well, there you go. And what do I do? Uh, 20. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Okay, good. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and let's do one more. This one, the last three numbers, oh, are 690. 690? Yep, 690. Yay. There you go. I love the Thank you. I trust you. Just wanted that. That one's you. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll do a little introduction. Um, my co-chair, Debbie Kirk, is not able to be here today. So, and I told her I would do this as long as I didn't have to be on camera. <laughs> 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 okay, our, our speaker, Dave Carter, is a native of Arkansas. After 10 years career in advertising and publishing in New York and a decade in the floral industry in Dallas, she did move back to her homestead, uh, her hometown, Hot Springs. Wanting to live in the country, she homesteaded in Bismarck to begin growing vegetables and raising goats and chickens for cheese and eggs. She founded Blooming Wands Farm three years ago to focus specifically on growing fresh cut organic flowers for local floors, even event planners and her clients. Uh, and I'm excited to welcome Dana Carter. I don't think this goes well. I'm, I'm, I got my microphone. And um, it was interesting. She gave you a lot of information that I'm going to kind of elaborate on. I, um, I'm from Hot Springs. I was raised on a dairy farm. Let me get to that slide. Okay, my family had um, Carter's Dairy. When I was growing up, we were literally drinking the milk my family made in grade school. So um, that was kind of interesting. My um, my dad and my grandfather started that. My grandfather was illiterate, and the reason they started it was because my dad was illiterate, and he was able to do all the paperwork. Uh, my grandfather was the master who knew all about cows and been milking all his life. Anyway, a little side note is that um, I have grandmothers that were great cooks. I mean, incredible cooks. Nobody made better biscuits than my than my Carter and my grandmother. My other grandmother made the best fried chicken. My mother, however, was a horrible cook. <laughs> and she wasn't a horrible person, she was a horrible cook. <laughs> so we were really grateful to my grandmothers. Um, I personally did not know what a bad cook she was, but we were getting off the bus one day, and one of my younger sisters said, we got to get her out of the kitchen. You don't, you won't believe what she's feeding us. And I said, what? And she goes, she, she's opening cans of cream of mushroom, and she's calling it gravy. We've got to get her out of the kitchen. We're all going to die. You know? And the only thing I knew is that my mother's reference book was the Better Homes and Gardens Red Checker book. That's all I knew. So I always kind of compared the bad cooking with that good book. So that, there's a reason I'm telling you this story. So anyway, I um, 
grew up on the farm, graduated from high school with the University of Arkansas, got a degree in chart muscle. But at that time, I did not want to live on a farm. I wanted to move to the big city. I didn't want to be anybody's daughter, granddaughter, niece, sister. I all been through summer, no one knew me. I really wanted to start a new. I didn't want to smell manure. I didn't want to talk about cows or chickens or eggs or any of that. I wanted to get as far away as I could. And I got to do that. My first job in New York, I worked on Madison Avenue um, for about five years as a copywriter. And I really wanted to work in publishing. And I got to work in publishing. And this is where I got my first job. <laughs> Not only that, my first job, I was in charge of Better House and Gardens Cook Cook Division. <laughs> and my first job book was that red and white checkered book. So I, mean, I tried not to have flashbacks to New York. And I, believe me, I looked all through that book. I went to archives everywhere. There was never a recipe for opening a can of green mushrooms. <laughs> In fact, the recipes were really good. I suspect my mother never opened that book. That's what I'm thinking. But she's just never had an interest in cooking. She's the only person I know that has set fire to a microwave meal in a microwave. <laughs> so the deal is, is that when you're on the phone with her and you hear something buzzing, I always say, do you have an appliance on? Put the phone down, I'll plug the appliance now for you. So that's the story on her. But I, I was really lucky. I started in the cookbook division, and then I eventually took care of the crafts division, the country division. We bought another um, four books from popular mechanics and woodworking. And then I, I did that for a couple of years. And then I went on to be a, a promotion manager for 12 national magazines. So it all sounds very impressive, doesn't it? <laughs> the reason it's impressive is that if you lived and worked in New York, you would have an impressive job too. Because New York had impressive jobs, you know. But I love that. I, lo I know a lot about cooking and I know a lot about cookbooks. But <clears throat> I, I did it for a long time. At one point, I realized the only place for me to go would be to be a publisher. And publishers really don't have good jobs. You know, they beg for advertising. I mean, it's just not such a great thing. So I thought it would be a good idea to go to Dallas. I was going to go and get a second degree at the Art Institute, and my plan, my plan was to be a script writer and move to Hollywood. That was my plan. If I could do that in New York, I could do it in Hollywood. So that was my plan. Now, while I was doing that, I started working for a nursery. And then I got a job at Florist. And then I started working for a garden designer. I still, we're going to Hollywood, we're going to Hollywood. And uh, then I worked for another florist. I'm doing nothing but nursery work and florist work and still thinking I'm going to be a writer. <clears throat> the Dallas Morning News calls, and I got a job doing their better, their garden section, that's right, their garden section of the paper. I developed uh, projects that anybody could make. They would call me at Halloween and say, we want to do something with pumpkins. But I had to come up with a project that anybody could make. I had one sister who <coughs> could make pictures with a gun to her head. She, had to, and she was always my experiment. She could make the project we were in. You know, so I did that for them. And she asked me once, my editor asked me to do some garden markers. And I said, why peas and beans? And she said, no, we want them to be whimsical. I said, okay. So I went to the hardware store and I picked up a bunch of stuff, not really knowing what I was going to use. I used some screens, some galvanized wire. And I came up with these garden markers that were beaded flowers. I had some that had fairies that had little signs that said grow up. And, you know, they were just whimsical things. And so I took them to her and she said, oh, we won't be able to use these. And I said, why? She said, they're too complicated. And I said, I put these up in my kitchen in about five minutes. She goes, I know you did, but they're too complicated. We just gave you some. And I said, okay. She said, but I'll pay you as if we run them in the paper. And I put them in my yard, which I didn't care. I was, I just wasn't, I wanted the check. So uh, I was having lunch with a friend after that. And I was telling that story and I'd gone on to something else. Like I needed to get my cleaning. And she said, can we go back to the, uh, the garden marker story? I said, okay. She goes, do you have any more of those? I go, yeah. Because you need to take and sell them. You need to go to gift stores and sell them. I said, don't no, ask me if I made them in vacation bottles. Well, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and she said, I dare you. Just go to one store. <laughs> one store. So I walked in a store with these um, little metal galvanized daisies and beaded things. And as I was walking in the store, people tried to buy them off me. I mean, as I was walking in. And the ladies there said, um, 
Well, there were there were sisters. One is head up in the original Williams that's now in Dallas. They got in business together. She said, my sister's not here, so I've got a decision, but if we were to sell them, what are they? And y'all, I, I didn't expect that question. I didn't expect them to see me. And so I just off the top of my head, I said, they're living ones. And she said, oh, how enchanting. I go, yes, enchanting living ones. That's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was just going with it. I didn't know what. Well, it turns out that those living ones turned into power crosses. And I started a business making copper crosses that are from this size to as tall as me. And next thing I knew, I had a rep group. And so now I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be doing crosses. I'll have a little business doing crosses. And I was in Little Rock at the uh, horticulture because there was a gift store there, and they, they agreed to see me. And while I was showing them all these crosses, she said to me, she goes, oh, Chris Elson's been looking for a copper artist. Do you think you're selling some fountains? I said, sure. So they commissioned me to make seven fountains for the Arkansas Flower Show. Again, the Arkansas Flower Show. <laughs> and um, so I, I had to leave my job and move to Arkansas because these fountains took like three car garage. And, I mean, it was, they were huge fountains and I had to make them in like two months. So I did that. And the next thing I knew, I had to do a trellis for the McMath Library. And one thing led to another. I, um, I moved to the country, I moved to Bismarck. The farm that, that I live on in Bismarck was the second dairy farm. The farm, the business had gotten so big that they needed another farm, they needed more cows to go. That's the farm I live on. So that's the farm I kind of grew up on in that we kind of got to run wild there. And we would sit on the back of pickup trucks, bell got seeds, hay seeds, we would seed and you know, we just have a lot of good memories of that. Um, so, and this is the view from my dad. I have bass in my pond. my pond. It's absolutely beautiful. But I live in a very small dog truck, and I literally have two rooms. So when people come to visit, they go, I could stay here forever. And I go, well, at dark, you're leaving. So, <laughs> you know, you're welcome to stay as long as you want, but at dark, you will have to go. I started with chickens, and I do sell um, fresh chickens. And then I started goats. The reason I got goats is because I make goat cheese. I make feta and shell. I'm Nigerian dwarf goats because they have the highest butter fat. And they're also the meat goats. So I did that. <clears throat> and then I decided to start vegetables. Y'all, I started with a lawnmower and one out. That is all I have. So the first year was pretty grueling, I gotta tell you. But I started vegetables, I started growing tomatoes, early tomatoes. And so, you know, started doing pretty well. So I went to farmer's market and I sold cinnamon rolls. Um, eggs, tomatoes, goat cheese, and jelly. So this went on for about three years. I was on my deck one morning having coffee, and I thought, what would I like to see growing in my fields? And I thought I would say asparagus, and I thought flowers. And I thought, oh my God, flowers. I never thought about flowers. And economically, it just makes more sense. When you lose a tomato plant, you may have lost $25 or $30 worth of revenue. You lose a flower, you just lost animals. That's it. So economically, it made a lot of sense. So the first year, I did a little flowers, and I sold them at the farmer's market, just small bouquets. Didn't do that much. I was just kind of making the transition. The second year, I, oh, this is what I was going to tell y'all. If you're a beginner, and you're thinking about doing this, you need to take it slow. If you jump on your horse, your horse is probably going to throw you. So. <laughs> So if you're thinking about doing this, first you need to get honest with yourself. You need to gather pictures of all the flowers you love, and you need to sit down, and I know you don't want to do this because I don't want to do it either. You need to sit down and look at every single flower that you love. You need to look to see if it grows in shade or grows in shine. You need to see if it needs, what kind of soil does it need. You need to find out what diseases it suffers from. So you can kind of figure that out because there's a lot of insects you can get that will take care of those diseases for you. And uh, then you need to find a spot on your property. Okay, now, this works really, really well in the very, very beginning, but, and this was year one for me. I was still doing the vegetables, and I started joining the seniors. The second year, I had lots and lots of flowers in the month of June. I'll say that again. I had lots and lots of flowers in the month of June. <laughs> now, it's great to have a lot of flowers, but when you have 40 buckets of flowers and you need to sell them today, it's very stressful. So 
And then I hear, it just so happened that I have, along with my other animals, I have five Great Pyrenees dogs. I don't know if you know what a Great Pyrenees dog is, but they're like small shabby puppies. In fact, they're like the size of polar bears. And, um, but they, um, and they're farm dogs, they protect my goats, they protect my property. But they, they had been rolling in the mud and they were splashing on my deck, and I finally said, okay, I've got to get them broke. Now my dogs went 150, 200 per dog, get them broke. But there was a girl down the road, it was a mobile river, who came to my house and broke my dogs. She was there for about six hours. And when she came to get paid, I had coffee with her, and I told her that I really wanted to be a flower farmer, but I obviously knew I grew flowers, but I hadn't figured out the logistics of how do you have flowers in April, May, June, July, with all this. And she said, it's interesting that you asked. I was a flower farmer for years, <laughs> and I just moved from South Arkansas. I had four greenhouses, and I would be glad to be your mentor. <laughs> now think about that. My dogs, and she's my mentor. Anyway, she sat down with me. Thank you, God. She sat down with me, and she said, this is what you're going to order, this is when you're going to plant it, and this is when you're going to harvest it. And you're going to order seeds from this place, you're going to order bulbs from this place, and these are the seeds you're going to start, and this is when you're going to And there was just this whole thing to go by. And the next year, lo and behold, I went crazy and bought a tractor. Yes, I bought a tractor. And I will tell you, I love my truck, but I let you take my truck before I let you take my tractor. <laughs> Because I'm crazy about my tractor. It just it's changed my life. Because remember, I just had a lawnmower and I had a little bitty teller. So this was life changing. Another thing I did, I got a grant through the Department of Agriculture and they paid for my new house. The only thing I had to pay for was to get people put together. But they paid for it. So that was another thing I found out. A friend of mine came to Parker's Market and he said, you know, Jane, how big's your garden? And I'm telling him, he goes, you know, the Department of Agriculture does this. Because he worked for them. I said, yeah, yeah, like, what's the big deal? And he goes, fill out an like, application. They'll come out and look at it. They'll take care of it. And they did. What they did, they came and looked at it, but they said, well, we would like you to, we would like for your garden to be bigger, so we can give you a bigger hoop house next year. So make your garden bigger, and we'll come back, we'll take a big drive, and we'll give you a bigger greenhouse. And that's what they did. Now, just so you know, there's a difference between a hoop house and a greenhouse. A greenhouse is heated and you're planting on tables. A hoop house is to extend your season. You plant the ground. So I started growing stuff in February. In fact, uh, my snapdragons were, were planted in October. So I'm planting stuff because my hoop house is about anywhere from 15 to 20 degrees warmer. So in the summertime, all the walls are lifted and fans are brought in, and it's about 120 degrees without that. So, I mean, you can't work in the hoop house after 10 in the morning. I mean, you just can't. But I have an irrigation system and all this, so my fourth year, this is what my hoop house looks like now. So we've come a long way, a long, long way. Um, and so on the left are snapdragons, and toward the front are pin cushions. These right here, this row right here is a new hybrid. It's summer snapdragons. So I'm going to have snapdragons this summer because they can take the heat. It's a new product. Uh, the middle thing is like Lysianthus, diathesis, and yarrow. And the far side is diathesis, um, bells of Ireland, Russian sage, and um, eucalyptus. This is my hoop house. I have two other gardens. So this is just the hoop house. Anyway, so. Advice to the crazy and delirious, okay? Do you want to be a flower farmer? I mean, seriously, do you want to be a flower farmer? Okay, the first thing you're going to have to do is give up on all the flowers you love. I know you love them. I know you think they're pretty. But if they're not going to sell, you don't get to grow. <laughs> so, and you can grow them for your own. But if you're in here for the money, you're going to have to grow flowers that they love. So, I did. A year before I, I would say the second year, when... I had gotten that mentor, and I, I really kind of felt like I knew what I was doing, but I really needed her direction. So I started talking to florists long before I had flowers to deliver. I started talking to wedding planners long before I had flowers to deliver, and um, event planners. And I just started handing out business cards. I sat down with every florist, and I said, tell me what flowers you buy in April. Tell me what flowers you never get enough of. Tell me what flowers you use every single week without fail. And that's what I did. 
So I got very specific about that stuff. Um, also, you need to decide on how much income you want to make your first year. Now, and you need to start a Facebook and an Instagram. Now, a lot of people think, oh, I'll get a Facebook when my farm's established, or I'll do an Instagram when my farm's established. I wish I'd done this sooner because I think I would have been better off if I had started when I had nothing in the farm and my little lawnmower and my hoe and said, this is what we're doing. I think the audience would have said, she really has lost her mind. <laughs> but we should keep following her to see where this is going to go. Because when I started doing that, I got a lot of questions from people that I was able to answer. And I slowly but surely kind of got a community to follow me. And that was really, really helpful. So that's something I think you should do long before you think you need to do it. Okay, now I would also I also do weddings along with uh, the events and selling a florist. If you plan on doing that, I would get wholesale accounts with florist because I don't care who you're doing flowers for. She's gonna want purple roses, and you don't grow purple roses. Or she's got so they're gonna want something that you don't grow, and I don't grow roses. I, from my experience on people that I've talked to. If you want to grow, if you want roses, then you just grow roses, and that's how you grow. You grow acres of them. If you want it to be profitable, I could have a couple of bushes of roses, but I'm only going to get 10 or 15 roses off that bush. When you need your roses for weddings, they want 100 roses. So I always buy those wholesale. <clears throat> also, I don't like the hassle of roses with the black spot. I mean, how did that work on? Also, develop a seed schedule and stick to it. And that means write down when you start them in the house, write down when you're putting them in the field, write down when you think they're going to play. Just write that stuff. So when you get up every morning, you know exactly what you're supposed to do. I used to get up every morning just in a panic. Okay, I have a hundred things to do. What should I do first? You know? So I would just kind of put out fires as I went. Now I get up in the morning and go, okay, you need to weed this, you need to plant that, and you need to harvest this. It just makes more sense. Um, now, as I start small, I think, as a master gardener and just as a gardener, period, from the gardeners that I know, I think we our eyes are always bigger than, than our energy level. You know? So when someone says, Well, I want to make fifty thousand dollars this year, well, first of all, you're gonna have fifty thousand seeds from the get-go. From the get-go, you're gonna have to have fifty thousand seeds. So you might want to rethink this if you're just starting. Why don't you do two hundred seeds or maybe three hundred seeds and go from there? because it's real easy to get overwhelmed. I have found that flower farming is much harder than vegetable farming. And that's probably, that probably sounds counterintuitive, but the thing about flower farming is you have flowers developing and blooming at different times. When you grow a vegetable garden, your tomatoes come in all summer, your peppers come in all summer, so you just kind of harvest it all year. You kind of harvest when you want to. With flowers, there are flowers that you harvest right before they bloom. So you're looking every day as to what stage things are in. There are some things that you don't get to harvest until they've completely bloomed, but you gotta harvest them that day. You can't wait a day. Um, one of the tricks that I did learn was, and this sounds so crazy, I wouldn't have believed it. If you have flowers, which I'm hoping some of y'all do, if you have flowers and you harvested them, but you forgot you left some on the ground, and you go out the next day and your flowers laying on the ground, you think, well, they're dead. They're not. Bring them in the house, cut the ends of them, and sit them in a pot of boiling water. Well, boil the water, pour in a pot. You want to be one. If you'll set your stems in there for just a couple of minutes, it sounds so brutal, like you're burning your flowers. No, what it does, it really opens up the stems. And if you'll take them for there, put them in cold water, they will come back. I had a tulip that was literally like this. When I put it, and two hours later, it was like this. And you would never have thought that was work. You never did. The reason I know these things is I invested on watching a woman who has florid farms. And the reason I started watching her is that she started her farm with two toddlers in tow and like three irises and four begonia things. And that's where she started. She has one of the biggest flower farms in the United States today because this is 20 years down the road. But I knew if this woman could figure out how to take care of toddlers and start a farm, she had some shortcuts and she had a bunch of them. So I watched her and I learned a whole lot from her. There's another woman named Lisa Mason Ziegler, and all her stuff is free. And 
She, even her seminars are like $50 and they're on demand. She has great information, really good information. She's the one that wrote Cool Flowers. And um, she, only, she only grows annuals and that does really well for her, which I thought was interesting. She doesn't do very many perennials, but almost everything she does, she plants in October. Block spurge, a thick of this stuff, jet lock. I mean, Rebecca, I mean, everything is planted in October. And I just, it, that never occurred to me. I guess because I always think everything should be planted in March. And I thought I was getting way ahead of the story because I was planting things in January and February. But I have beautiful Nigella this year, I have beautiful Block Spark, and I planted it all in November, and I just thought, we're just going to make it through the, the winter. And everything will make it in the winter if it's hardy to zone seven. It's on seven, you can plant it in October and it'll be fine. I don't care how cold it gets, I don't care if there's snow. The only things that suffer from snow and ice are things that are above water, above the ground. You know, like your hydrangeas or your camellias or your, I mean, those are the things that suffer from frost. Flowers need that time to bridge out. You know, so that's still. Now, I also, this year I started doing garden consulting and landscaping. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, um, and I'm really glad I'm doing it because I've, I've already done quite a few jobs. And there's no way I could have done this if I hadn't learned so much about flowers, you know. And I'm obsessed. I watch videos constantly. I'm constantly reading about it. I'm completely obsessed with flowers and how to grow. So that's the deal with that. So I want to show you, I'm in the middle of learning my landscape <clears throat> software. So I always give people pictures. And Pat, I will give you a picture. But it's probably going to be more like the one on the right as opposed to the one on the left. I'm just like, it's going to be color coded. But until I learn the landscape, so you may not get this picture at the beginning. <laughs> so um, that's the deal. Do you all have any questions? Because I was going to show you a little flower arrangement that y'all can make real quick. It take a lot of expertise. I thought y'all might like that. Yeah. 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 Um, also, I saw this graph. These are these are called Nigella. And they look like little fairies, little fairy flowers. And you think, oh, they're so pretty. The deal is that florists are not so interested in these blue flowers. What they're interested in is when they get a seed and make those spike pods. And that's what they're interested in having. It's all these little things. That you don't think make a difference, and it does. So there's my Nigella. This is yarrow. Yarrow comes in pastels, and it comes in dark reds and blues, and dark reds and purples, one of things like that. And of course, I love peonies. Now the thing about peonies, you can't harvest them for four years. For four years. And when I say you can't harvest them, you can't even pick them at all. You have to look at them in your garden and say, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> That's lovely. But you sell them for $5 a stem for sale. But you got to wait four years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and these are not my roses. I don't grow roses. One thing you can do is, this is just a regular vice. It doesn't have a hole in it. I put some oasis in it with some water. Okay. And all I'm going to do, these things are great. You can always take, well, we're going to be in trouble if I don't find the end of this tape. <laughs> you can set yourself up, oh, no, sorry. you can set yourself up a little bit. You can keep your uh, flowers in a session. <laughs> Just gives you a little more control. So if you want to do, let's say you want to do a little chubby, all right? I don't know. These these roses are from Kroger. So um, I don't know how fresh they are. But I got them anyway. So you can start to do yourself a little chubby, all right? Don't you love me throwing leaves on the ground? 
Daniel, why do we have to wait four years on the fumes? Because they've got to have an extremely strong root system. And that root system takes four years. It's the difference between having 20 blooms or having two. Because that root system is key for you to have more flowers. So actually you're retarding it if you, if you harvest them earlier. You know? And to be honest with you, my mentor didn't tell me that when we bought them. So I'm so excited. She goes, yeah, it's going to be great. You can pick those in four years. I was like, four years? What are you talking about? She goes, oh, did I not say that? I don't know. You never mentioned that. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, and I've got about 20 plants. And they're expensive. So I'm very excited to have them now. But these, you've got to watch them. They'll bloom in a day. They'll go from a round ball, and then they'll just bloom. So you pick these when they're still a round ball, but when you touch them, they feel like marshmallows on top. That's when you pull them. And if you'll wrap them in newspaper and put them in a paper sack and put them in a cooler, they'll last for two months. But you need to check on them because you want to make sure they're not getting too much moisture because they will rot on you. You know, but if you wrap them in newspaper, well, you're gonna you're gonna hydrate them first. You're gonna put them in some water and hydrate them, then pull them out. Wrap them in newspaper, put them in another paper bag, and put them, check on them every couple of days, and make sure there's not too much moisture. Is each one in its own newspaper? You can actually put the newspaper down and just roll them, like lay them out and then just roll them, just so they're not touching each other. That newspaper will absorb moisture, but it won't take all of it. You see what I mean? I'll be talking on yourselves if you want. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with this while I'm talking to you. But that's the deal with the peonies. And peonies is also another thing that you really have to be careful not to plant it too deep where it won't run it off. I mean, you barely, it's almost even with the crown. You know, it really is. All of these things are so important when you're doing this stuff because you really need to watch stuff on people that know what they're doing. Because when you're investing like this, those little things that they're telling you make a huge, huge difference. Like this stuff about peonies or how you how you cut them. A lot of times I'll just go to Google and put in when is the best time to harvest flowers for the longest baseline. And that's when I tend to get my best information. Is that regular scotch tape or is that a special? No, it's just regular scotch tape. Regular scotch tape. Does anybody want to sing? For the weekend? <laughs> Any plans for the weekend? You know, y'all are really making me nervous. <laughs> Can y'all like look away or <laughs> something, anything? So, are most of your peonies that you plant, you start with bare root? Yep. And then it usually takes how long for them to bloom? Well, they'll bloom the first year. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, know, you just have to look at them. Take pictures of them, admire them from afar. Because I bought a peony at Lowe's. Mm -hmm. I think I've had it three years. Okay. Two or three years. It hasn't bloomed yet. And I know it's not planted too deep because I see the eyes. I'm going to ask you a really important question. Okay. Have you fertilized it? No. Okay, well, that's usually the problem. <laughs> okay. But I have all the other ones that are blooming without fertilizer. Okay. So I guess that's what I. 
Well, uh, that's always what I'll say. Okay, you know, if, I'll try. Bush comes to shock. You mom right, go to fertilizer. Okay, I'll try something. <laughs> and also, things tend to need more water than you think they do. Right. You know, that's been my experience. Like, I grow lots and lots of sunflowers. And I always like them sunflowers get, you know, of course, we give them water. Turns out sunflowers need water like you can't believe. And I would not have guessed that. I would not have guessed that they needed that much water, but they need water like crazy, and they're watered every day. Because sunflowers, they grow so fast, and they're shooting up all the time, they just go through that water like crazy. So, like tomatoes, I water tomatoes once a week, really deep, so deep that if I step there, they might be up to my ankles. But um, I just keep water on sunflowers all the time. Well, a few years ago, you bought a a lot, or I don't know if it's a lot, but a bare root peonies, and you were selling them. Yes, and then, yes. Okay, yes. I bought from you, and all all of those have bloomed. Uh, well, because you bought them from me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we even asking that question? <laughs> of course, because you have to be. No, I mean, because I really recognize the places I bought them from. I mean, right, um, right. I'm, ju I'm just saying, and, but here I bought this one for Lowe's, and it's just sitting there with foliage, so I will put the fertilizer. Yeah, well, this is. I work for Lowe's. <laughs> we have all the uh, lawyers representing Lowe's. Because I want to know now. Um, this is what I think about Lowe's. I think if you're going to go get flowers in there, you need to go on Tuesdays. Yeah. Because they usually come on Monday afternoons and they're not so stressed. But when plants are put on trucks and planes, and everybody's being really careful, the temperature and all that stuff. I will tell you that the plant is so stressed when the temperature changes on it, the water conditions change from it. Right. Right. They're trying to water, they're moving them, they're putting in places, they're putting them in boxes, they're covering them, they're giving them light. You know, I mean, they're schizophrenic by the time they arrive. Everybody's just exhausted. You know, they get to Lowe's and they just water them like crazy. And again, everybody's just exhausted. So I think the best thing to do is order from nurseries. You know, I order a lot of. I order, sorry, I order from nurseries that are near, like in Arkansas or Missouri or Louisiana, that if they're having to travel, they're not traveling very far. Right. The best thing to do is actually be able to go to that nursery. And we have some great nurse, nurseries in Arkansas. You know, we have Baker Street Seeds, that's a good place, and just a lot of good things like that. So I'm not going to finish this. I'm just going to show y'all this is something that you could do and cover it with flowers as you want. But you don't have to worry about watering it. It's got water. You don't have to worry about that. So this is just something else you could do very quickly. Here's some yarn. Or you could even take things that are even longer and put them in there if you want to. But it gives it some height, you know, a little bit of height. So that's something you could do. You can never have the roses, which is probably going to make a statement. Yeah. And you could do them different hots if you wanted to. So that's one thing you could try. Yeah. The other thing, I guess we're just going with the water we have in this bucket, which is going to be scary, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's amazing, it's clear. So you just have this little simple thing. Little simple thing here. And a lot of times, you don't have to, you can use the same kind of flower for the whole thing. And a lot of us feel like, no, you know, you use all these different flowers. No, you can use the same kind of flower. You can do this with daisies or, or roses or anything. You know, you want to do is kind of think of about it being like this. You're just going to make a glove over it. So, let's say you're going to start like this. Just for now. Just for your height. And then you can adjust it. You can always cut it. Can't do that. 
，那是叫。OK， how many people here grow flowers? Okay. How many people here grow vegetables? Okay. How many people are growing your flowers with your vegetables? Okay. How many people have done some research on those um, insects that are beneficial to your flowers? You? So, um, there are, for instance, basil. If you plant basil around things, it will be rid of flight. Um, there's a lot of um, herbs and flowers that you can grow them here, near flowers. It gets rid of the disease that they suffer from. They're called trap bugs. They trap them. In other words, they might get bugs on that plant. It doesn't kill that plant, but they eat on that plant. It's in the on the flowers. So they're called trap flowers. So that's something you might really look into. I think there's a book called Good Bug, Bad Bug, that sort of thing. That's really helpful. I've really been researching that this year and doing a lot of that. So, to do this, but I'm going to take this apart. <laughs> Gotta be done. That's a hard flower, I promise it's okay. The flowers are, are hard. Do you still sell at the farmer's market? You know. I didn't sell at the farmer's market last year, and I, you know, they, they would really like for me to come back. I, I would love to say some of my flowers with my cinnamon rolls. I make cinnamon rolls that are about this big, and they sell really well. <laughs> I mean, I have a mixer at home that's in a desk room, and it's like you know, 100 at a time. I'm a cinnamon roll maker, but um, I don't know. I mean, I sell them at the farmer's market. I don't know. 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 I think I may do that just one time, pay fifteen dollars to have a bit, and I'll go when I have extra flowers. Yeah. You know, but the rate that I'm going right now, last year I sold every flower that I grew. And so far this year, I'm I've sold every flower that I grew. And the reason I do that is because I know what they're gonna buy. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't learn anything else from me, the deal is is that if you grow things white, you sell them all day long because every florist wants something white. There's always white. And they always need something white, and they always need something burgundy. And I don't know who came up with this color scheme, but some way, apparently doing drugs, came out with the idea that every product book has should have burgundy flowers in it. I don't care if it's in April or May or June. So we're all growing burgundy flowers because they'll have an orange bouquet with a burgundy flower, or a pink bouquet with orange and a burgundy flower. And I'm trying to talk them out of it, I'm trying to manipulate them, all kinds, and that's what they want. They want everything has to have a burgundy flower. So that's nothing else to think about. So here's just an example of just throwing them all in there. You know, and if you really wanted to enhance it, you could just go with that. Put even more flowers in it. But if you want to go crazy and live on the edge, live on the edge, you could do something as simple as. Something simple as this. And all of a sudden it comes really good. Yeah. Or even something very generic, just some regular yarrow. It doesn't seem like it's really that big a deal. But all of a sudden, when you do it, all of a sudden, something you know. Yes, you know, these little simple things that make a difference, you know. I mean, I. I've been trying about really, really, really talented people. And the deal is that once you have the, just the basics of how to do flower arranging, once you have the rules, then you can start breaking them. 
You know, it's like English. Once you know the English language, then you can start back home. So, but you just don't want to put any in grain or anything. You could, you could, but I'm just saying, you could start this and it'd be fine. And if you want to put some granary, like, turns out I've got some granary. Mm -hmm. So let's say we want to put some granary in here. The follow you on Facebook, is it Blooming Wands? It's Blooming Wands, yeah. yeah. Okay. And you'll probably announce there if you decide to go to the farmer's market one week. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, just, just. So let's say you want to do some greenery. But what I would do is that I would just put the greenery maybe in the circle in the middle. Or maybe just one piece. Let's say this is white instead of pink. Or maybe just do one piece like this. Or maybe do two of them. Just on one side. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do too. I mean, I'm all about putting strange colors together, like purple and red and that sort of thing. But I just wanted to show y'all that there are things that you can do that will, that are easy to do. You can do it with glue and tape and that sort of thing. But if you've got scissors and you've got a vase and you've got water, you go get wildflowers. You know, I have a I have one florist that calls me in the summer and they say we want wildflowers. And I go. Exactly what do you mean? And they go, I want you to go to the field and I want you to find wildflowers. So last summer, I was in deep grass, rubber boots, hoping I wasn't going to sit on a snake, cutting just crazy wildflowers. And I have fever fuel everywhere. And I didn't even know that. So I have all these wildflowers, all these little bitty wildflowers, and I took them to such a big hit. He called the next week and said, Can you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> so I was in swamps and you know all kinds of stuff. So that's the deal. So wildflowers apparently is the is a big deal, and all the brides these days they want everything organic. Yeah. So they like a lot of grasses and, and that sort of thing. So guys, I don't have anything else for y'all. I do have with those cars, but I'm like a thing. Um, I do it two ways. Either I can come to your place, I'll measure your beds. If you don't have any beds, we'll talk about your beds. <laughs> and um. I'll figure out probably the best place to plant what you want. We'll give you a list of plants to plant, and I'll hand it to you. And I'll charge you a flat fee more. I will come, I'll do all that. I'll find the plants, I'll buy the plants, I'll plant the plants, I'll water the plants, and then I'll charge you. <laughs> <laughs> Just know you'll always get charged. That's the whole thing. <laughs> I'll never cease doing that. So, if y'all have any more questions, that's all I've Thank you, Dana. That was, I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> um, next month, the 17th, we are having Debbie Tripp on herbs. And that also, I think, will be really interesting. So I'm glad you all came. And I guess any other any questions or anything? No? Yes, ma'am? Yeah, Dana, one more question. Do you have tours of your. Yeah. But no one is allowed to come to my farm. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because if you were allowed to come to my farm, that means that I would have to keep my house straight. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, flowers. my house always looks like someone is like hosted or murdered. <laughs> you know, so I, mean, I, I have no time to spend on my house at all. At all. Um, the best I can do is get my dishes done every day. That's it. You know, so I don't let people come to the farm. Now, I will say this. You as an individual called me and said, I have grandchildren, we understand your baby goats. Let me come see the goats. I'd let you come. Okay. You can't bring your <laughs> Sunday school class. You can't bring them. Yeah. I don't mind you doing that. I did do one thing with Mr. Barbie. I had everybody come to the house and it was huge. We had a slaughtering area for my hopper. We milked goats. Um, I had tours of the chicken coop and all of that. And it was a big hit. I had 50 cars in my driveway, 50 cars. And uh, it was a great hit. And I got all my hours for the year. <laughs> Let me tell you, I had six people helping me. We worked a week before people came. My farm will never look that good again. <laughs> so that's my attitude about the farm. So that's the show. I don't know what, how you have so much energy. <laughs> <laughs> very, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you. Oh, another question. How many? Do you have working on the front line myself? I do have 
young strapping men with gorgeous arms that come and work an hour here, an hour there. And I'm there now. That helps me a lot. You know, but if we break up, I don't think it'll help me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I do, I hire a lot of high school guys, you know, and they'll just come and work for me for two or three hours, you know, and I do that because there's some stuff I can I cannot unearth trees, you know, and there's stuff that I, can, I physically can't do, and I'll get them to do that, but I pretty much do everything by myself. So, I got a question. When you were cutting wildflowers huh? and, uh, the preservation factor was that different than your garden flowers in terms of keeping them fresh and, and all of that? Oh, what you're asking if they lasted as long? Yes, yes. I've always picked once in a while, I go around and pick wild flowers and take and put them into the water like you do. Just make sure and you it, it's dry. They all, most of them will die. But you'll strip the leaves off of them at the bottom and cut them at an angle okay. and put them in water at the bottom. You I mean, let me, let me, let me cut them and put them in water. That's the game. Yeah. So, I hope that's helpful. But watch for snakes. I mean, really watch for snakes. <laughs> yep. That's it, I guess. Thank you, everyone. I hope you Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, they better wish you come here. Oh, okay. <laughs>